This work is uh, joined with all my wonderful students and collaborators, Pang Wei, Tao, Yushan, Steve, Emma, Dean, Lisa, Nelson, Tony, and Robin. Um, so let me begin now. So um, at Toronto, one of the mecca of deep learning. I'm sure all of you have very sophisticated ways of thinking about deep learning. So here's my very simple minded view on how deep learning works. So take your average uh, deep learning model. It's very big and powerful. And then when you feed it lots of data, you can get it to do amazing things. Is that about right, I think? Um, so for example, suppose you want to do um, medical imaging. So here's the task is you're given a uh, image of an x-ray and you want the model to make a prediction of whether there's uh, arthritis or not. So this actually works pretty well if you just use standard off the shelf uh, ConfNet machinery. Um, but what happens if a doctor comes and says, well, why do you think there's no arthritis here? And of course the model is, it's, it's hard to get the model to kind of give you an explanation. Um, and what happens if the doctor wants to intervene and say, actually, I, I, I don't think this is quite arthritis. Let's talk about it. And, you know, good luck talking to the, this guy. So uh, here's another example. So we're interested in text generation. It's known uh, uh, quite uh, by now that um, models such as GPT-2 or GPT-3 are extremely good at generating text that's fluent. But what happens um, if you wanted to um, control that generation and have it be based on facts. So I think about uh, unconditional generation is very, um, as uh, Stephen Colbert would put it, truthy. It, it looks good, but it's not really based on kind of anything. And of course, for real applications, we want generation to actually be based on um, you know, facts. So in other words, how can we steer language models? Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is taking a step back and looking at the development of all of these models. I'm focusing on NLP, but I think a similar story goes for other uh, fields such as computer vision as well. So there's been a lot of exciting progress. And because the work is so empirical, a lot of this progress is driven by various data sets that have come out. And there's also a lot of new data sets that are coming out. So the question I want to ask is what properties of these data sets are good for driving modeling innovation? So it's a very kind of ambitious question and we won't answer it. Um, so just don't get your hopes up, but we'll hopefully have an interesting discussion. I welcome you to join me on that discussion. Okay, so the rest of the talk is going to be in three parts. Uh, I'm going to first talk about concept bottleneck networks for interpretability, prefix tuning for steering language models, and this notion of data set concurrence which is a tool that will help us maybe talk about um, what data sets are good um, with a little bit more quantitative uh, you know, grounding. So if you have any questions in the interim, just feel free to um, interrupt. I don't know what your guys is a gen what you generally do, but um, maybe you can use the chat or uh, just feel free to raise your hand. So maybe I'll pause a little bit just in case there's uh, any initial uh, questions. Okay, so let's jump in. Concept model networks. So this is work uh, based on an ICML paper from last year with uh, Pang Wei, Tao, Yushan, Steve, Emma, and Dean. So let's revisit this X-ray application. So you want to take an X-ray and predict whether there's the whether there's arthritis here. And um, there's not really a good way of uh, getting explanation. You could try to uh, basically read its brain waves, you know, probing and uh, other types of uh, interpretability work tries to do this. But you know, what you get out um, might give you an explanation, but it's not what I would call the kind of a real explanation because there could be like some hidden stuff going on inside this model that you're not really you know, extracting out. Um, and furthermore, what about the interaction part? So um, suppose the doctor comes back and says, after the model predicts no arthritis, it's uh, she says, actually, I, I think there really is arthritis. I mean, this looks like arthritis. Why do you think there's no arthritis? And if a human were in, in place of the model, the human might be able to offer some explanation like, oh, it's because I didn't see any bone spurs. And then a dialogue could ensue. 
So the doctor could say, well, isn't this thing a bone spur over here? And then the human can say, oh, actually, oh, you're right. That is a bone spur. I didn't realize that. So now I agree that there's arthritis. So this is the type of interaction we would ideally like to have with our models, but we can't right now. And what's going on here abstractly is what I call test time interventions. So at test time, on a new example, you want to say, if high level concept equals new value, what would the prediction be? It's not quite a kind of causal counterfactual question, but it's uh, because it's with respect to the model as opposed to real world, but it has kind of that flavor. So most of the work in uh, interpretability and explanations uh, is what I would call post hoc. You train your model and then you try to coax it to do various things like reading out high level concepts. You can also change the model to be, uh, uh, can be a little bit more interpretable. And there's this huge uh, work in probing, especially in the NLP community, which is um, taking existing models and trying to uh, basically learn linear class or simple classifiers on top of it to predict various uh, concepts. Um, and the nice thing about post hoc analysis is that you can do what you were doing before. You get these expressive models and you can say something about them. But I want to say that there's no kind of uh, causal or intervention hooks into the model. You can't really um, talk to the model in some sense. So what we're going to do is revisit this really you know, old idea. Uh, I mean, it's with uh, learning from concepts. So what we want is constructive explanations. We want the model to make a prediction based on explanations, not uh, post hoc explanations. So there's this work uh, about you know, 10 years ago in vision and there's some work in NLP community, which is around um, prediction tasks where you predict through a set of high level attributes. For example, you're trying to predict polar bear, you get its color and whether it has stripes or it's fish and so on. And you know, this is kind of what we want, but you know, all this work fell out of favor, flavor um, um, app when deep learning kind of took over because we just simply got way better and more accurate models. So uh, the, the, somehow the, the accuracy gains were well worth the kind of interpretability losses. So now let's go back and say, can we actually revisit this and try to make this work? So we introduced this idea called concept bottleneck neck models, which is a really kind of remarkably simple idea. So the idea is that you take any network you want, um, um, your, let's say a ResNet, and you simply t pick one of the layers probably close to the, the end um, and resize it so that the number of hidden units is equal to the number of high level concepts you have. And then you know, you're going to train it, which I'll talk about later. So just to give you two examples that we looked at in this paper, the first one is this X-ray data set from Emma Pearson um, and others. Uh, you have an image and your goal is to predict the arthritis grade and the various high level concepts are whether there's a bone spur, whether there's a narrow joint space and so on. The other data set we're uh, looking at is this Caltech birds data set uh, where you're given an image of a bird, you wanna predict the species and the high level concepts might be wing color um, and beak length. So now given a, a concept bottleneck network, how do you train it? We're going to assume that our training data consists of extra annotations for every X, Y pair, input, alpha pair. You also have the full set of concepts available. And now how to train this thing is actually a little bit subtle. Um, so there's many possibilities with uh, different trade-offs. So um, I'm mean, gonna kind of consider this. So here's a baseline is that you ignore the concepts and you train um, just the vanilla end-to-end -end neural network X to Y. This is what you would do. Um, there should be an argument there. Um, and then this, the, maybe this, the most obvious way to incorporate the concepts is to do independent training. So now your network is really broken up into two parts, uh, G, which goes from X to C and um, F that goes from C to Y. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your x, y, uh, x, c pairs, train uh, the first part to the to predict your concepts, and then separately take your c, y pairs and predict uh, the c to y part. Um, so one problem with independent training is that at test time, we assume that uh, we don't have any concepts 
So that means what you're going to do is not, you're not going to be able to fit in the, the true um, C, the concepts, but you're going to be able, only be able to fit in the uh, predicted concepts, which causes a little bit of a distribution mismatch. So to compensate that for that, we can also do sequential training where um, instead of using the, um, the uh, this should be a Y actually, sorry about all this typos. Um, so instead of using a C here, what we're gonna do is use the uh, pr predicted concepts and try to predict uh, Y. Uh, and now finally, there's a, a more general way to think about this, um, which I think tries to recuperate some of the, um, the ideas of end-to-end -end, you know, training and try to interpolate them. So we're gonna introduce joint training with a lambda. And lambda is a term that's going to in, uh, allow us to trade off accuracy for interpretability intuitively. So this is going to be, a lambda is gonna be on the term of how much you wanna pay attention to concepts uh, plus how much you want to pay attention to the labels. And so if lambda equals infinity, then um, what we get back is the sequential um, method where you first really try to pay hard attention to getting the concept uh, right. And then separately you go and you train up the labels. If lambda is zero, then you get back the standard training. Okay, so here are four possible ways of using um, concept bottleneck networks. Well, I mean, really three plus a baseline. So how well does this work? Um, so we here's a plot uh, or a table that shows the various concept bottleneck networks um, and looking at the accuracy on both um, the pr uh, prediction of the target Y as well as prediction of the concept, which is a measure of uh, kind of interpretability. Um, and at least for the X-rays data set, there's no significant difference between all these methods while you can still get um, some explainability by predicting the concept. So in X-rays, um, concept bottleneck networks is a kind of automatic win because you don't lose anything in terms of prediction, accuracy, but you can also get more interpretability. Um, and now this, on the birds data set, things um, are a little bit more interesting. So there we see this trade-off, which I think caused these uh, types of intermediate models to be uh, fall out of favor is that the standard model works a lot better, this is error rate, than uh, the uh, concept bottleneck, independently trained concept bottleneck networks. And uh, what's, it, what's cool is that if you do joint training uh, with a particular value of lambda, you can actually recuperate a lot of this accuracy loss and get kind of comparable to standard um, accuracy with no loss in the prediction error of the concept uh, themselves. So this looks really promising because this allows you to um, get high accuracy and you know, good interpretability. Um, but there's an asterisk to that, which I'll come back to later. I see some questions in the chat. Should I go ahead and answer them? Yeah, it's up to you. If, you, if you'd like to answer them now, that would work. Sure. Um, so can we leverage autoencoder approaches for training or leverage or can we leverage causal sources for causes, causal sources identification approaches? Uh, so one thing to note is that we assume that the concepts are given um, as prior knowledge. And um, you could imagine that we would try to learn these automatically, uh, which, and the, but the danger there is that now you're kind of back to this um, you know, black box setting where you kind of just have to hope that you kind of learn the right thing. With additional prior knowledge, uh, maybe you could coax the right concepts out of the, the model, but there's no kind of maybe generic way um, to do that. Um, so why is lambda zero to infinity? Um, uh, so th this is because if lambda equals infinity, that allows us to get back the sequential um, setting. Um, and concepts are predefined before training, um, the answer is yes. Okay, so um, the takeaway here is that concept bottleneck networks broadly are competitive with, can be competitive with standard end-to-end -end training. In addition, they give you this uh, extra ability to meaningfully interpret the um, hidden units. So I'll come back to that point, uh, which uh, a little bit later. So uh, 
this is related to the question. So I remember I talked about how a lot of uh, interpretability work is post hoc. So you can train your standard model and then you can try to take the hidden unit layer and try to predict or probe out the various concepts. And what this experiment shows that is doing that actually doesn't really work. Um, you get much higher error uh, post hoc than if you had kind of built it in. And this is just to, as a kind of illustration to say that if you let the model do its own thing, there's no reason that it's going to uh, do it in the same way that maybe a doctor would want it to. So there's kind of no mind reading. You might be hope, I mean, I guess this is not obvious because a lot of structure does emerge kind of organically from end-to-end -end training, um, but um, it's, it's not a kind of a guarantee. Uh, it depends on the application. Um, I also want to highlight that uh, concept bottleneck networks, um, because they are more likely to kind of quote unquote learn the right thing, um, you expect them to be a bit more robust as well. So we had this uh, uh, created this data set where birds at training time were on different backgrounds than at test time. And we see that using the concept bottleneck networks does indeed um, produce higher accuracy, or sorry, lower error than um, using the standard model. And this is effective if we think that the concepts themselves are less prone to shift than the overall label. Um, and in many applications, I think there's more concepts. Concepts are on a lower level, so you might ex expect kind of a bit more stability there. Um, let's come back to this question of test time intervention, which I think really is the, uh, the underexplored but really interesting part of these models, which I want you guys to, you know, to take away with. So, um, here we have a concept of a model network that predicts through this hidden vector, which now each entry has semantic meaning. It's attached to one of the concepts. And suppose that the model got it wrong. Um, so no arthritis. The interesting thing now is that now there is a hook into the model. The doctors say, actually, I think there's a bone spur. So you can reach into this unit and just set it to a one. Right. Now, normally you can't go and mess around with uh, you know, the hidden units of um, networks, but in this case, you, you can. And this is meaningful, and this uh, allows you to um, ideally correct some of the errors based on the models, or at least get a better idea of what the model is thinking. So we did this uh, kind of or, um, experiment just to, as a proof of concept. So remember at test time, the model doesn't see any ground truth concepts. It has to predict the concepts, so which could be uh, error prone. So we simulate what happens if a doctor went in and replaced these predicted concepts with ground truth concepts kind of iteratively. So as you increase the number of concepts which are intervened, we can see that whether the, um, the accuracy uh, or sorry, the error goes down. And um, so just as a control, so the standard training, uh, the, the hidden units don't mean anything. So intervening with a true label doesn't do anything. Whereas the first takeaway is that all the concept bottleneck neck models do allow for some uh, non-trivial test time intervention. So you can go and you can tweak the models and you can improve error rates um, from there. Um, but one thing to, I guess, which is we found interesting is that the independent trained models uh, provide, provide best, better test time control. So remember the independent models train the, the concept to output component based on true uh, labels rather than the, uh, sorry, based on true concepts rather than predicted concepts. So in some sense, these models are better um, equipped to deal with the true concepts that the doctor would you know, provide. In other words, there's less distribution or shift um, happening um, with the independent models. So this gives a, you know, a more nuanced picture of you know, what it means to be explainable. So even though before we saw that um, if you just do independent training or joint training, you don't see a drop in the concept accuracy, but it does make a difference from the point of view of being able to intervene. So a question by Alex Adam, uh, what range of values are concepts allowed to take on? Uh, the particular concept were continuous, but how I would interpret a 0.18 bone spur for interpretability. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. One thing I should say up, 
say I kind of glossed over is that I presented this framework for regression. So um, there are, you know, everything's continuous. There's actually something you have to do differently for classification because the concepts you can't actually predict through discrete concept. Uh, I mean, you, you could, but that's not what we did. We predicted through the kind of the um, pre softmax uh, layer of the concepts. Um, so there's a little bit more uh, to say there. Um, you can you know, read the paper, but in general, um, we can think about uh, for classification as the numbers between you know zero and one. For the but but for regression, they don't have to be between zero and one. Okay, um, maybe let me summarize. So concept bottleneck networks or models rather is you know very simple idea. You take your favorite network and you can kind of adapt them to deal allow you to uh, use high level concepts. Um, we show that they can obtain comparable accuracy to standard models, so they're competitive. Um, the main thing to take away is that they allow for these constructive explanations, not post hoc explanations, which allows them then to support these test time you know, interventions. Um, there's still a lot of open questions here. We show two applications where these models make sense and get uh, high accuracy for, but there's many tasks that which it doesn't. For example, I think maybe face recognition is an example where if you ask someone why it was this face, you know, Chris uh, Madison's face, I would be like, I don't know. Um, and so I think we need a little bit more to articulate when these models are good and when kind of this type of constructive explanation makes sense. Um, a common question I do get is, how about relaxing the bottleneck assumption um, so that you uh, don't lose accuracy? And you could do that, uh, but there is always the danger that you sacrifice explainability because now if you introduce a, a direct path from X to Y, then the concepts could just be there for show. Like the model could just say, I'm gonna predict these concepts. And then by the way, I'm just gonna do my own thing from X to Y. And that would be a little bit of a, of a cheat. Um, and so we took this kind of more purist view where we're actually going to try to go through the concepts um, just to see how far we could get with this. But in practice, on other applications, I think you would probably have to make a compromise. Cool. Uh, any questions before I move on to the second part of the talk? Percy, I have a quick question. Uh, how do you choose which intermediate layer to constrain as the concept representation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we generally took the last uh, or penultimate layer. Um, and the idea is that these concepts are high level. Um, often there's like a linear classifier or a little small MLP that will take you from C to Y. Whereas the X to C part is more image uh, processing. Um, so these, uh, I think this framework is really useful when the concepts are high level. Um, this is maybe to take the opportunity to contrast with normal feature engineering. I think a lot of feature engineering, these features, which are, you can think about them as uh, concepts as well, are closer to the X because these are, have to be things that are basically programmatically defined. Whereas concepts are, have to be, you know, learned. Great, and uh, uh, it seems there's some more, we've opened ourselves up to questions. So uh, <laughs> oh, okay. maybe let's uh, uh, answer one more from the chat and we can cover the other ones later. So um, how about this one? So uh, it seems like there's more one, what, what happens when there are more one concepts that experts did not think about ahead of time? In other words, do you have to fix the number of concepts a priori by the types of concepts? Um, and have you considered getting around that and having a mechanism to discover new ones? Yeah, so uh, I, I should say that this work was largely inspired by um, this paper called Flock from uh, Michael Bernstein. He's a HCI researcher at Stanford. He has this really cool paper where um, concepts are actually solicited from crowd workers uh, in the kind of in a human in a loop uh, style. So um, to make this operationalize this, um, I would actually think about the concepts and the model training as um, done kind of jointly you know, with an expert. Um, so the expert, because the experts, I don't think is necessary real estate to think like, oh, okay, give the hundred concepts that you think are relevant. Um, I, I think, you know, the more we can bring 
the domain expert into the process of building these models, then I think the the more the better I think the expert will feel that this is actually representing um, the the prior knowledge of the expert. So it's a great question. Okay, so let me move on now to prefix tuning. So this is a really recent uh, um, paper um, uh, with uh, Lisa uh, from Stanford and. As a motivating task, let's consider the problem of table to text generation. So the setup is that you're given a structured set of facts about, let's say in this case, uh, um, a review, and you're trying to generate an English description that realizes this, uh, these facts in fluent uh, prose. Um, so the standard way to do these, this task these days is that you go and download your, uh, the largest model you can find. Um, maybe it's a GPT-2 for now and you fine tune it. And this actually works you know, pretty well. So the problem with fine tuning is that um, these models are pretty big. GBD2 XL is uh, 1.5 billion parameters. And if you imagine like fine tuning this for every single task, you would have to store an independent copy of all the parameters, even if your task didn't really kind of need all those parameters. And of course you can do distillation or something, but you know, maybe let's look at uh, maybe an alternative. So there's uh, works that address lightweight fine tuning. So here the idea is that maybe you can tune a subset of the parameters. Um, so you can tune the top two layers, which amounts to 20% of the parameters. Um, we'll show later that this loses accuracy. So this isn't very effective, even though that's probably the, the kind of the initial thing you would try. There's more sophisticated ways. There's this nice idea called adapter tuning that uh, basically inserts little trainable modules at every kind of position in the transformer. And then it kind of uh, adds them into the prediction. So you're kind of modifying the predictions in, in this kind of very um, uh, distributed way. And they get pretty good results. So you can get comparable performance we'll see later by tuning only 3% of the parameters. So now our goal is to say, can we even do better? Can we reduce the number of tunable parameters even more than that? So we draw inspiration from um, in context learning from GPT-3. And here it's in the extreme, right? You're not doing any tuning at all. So instead what you do is you construct this prompt. The prompt has an instruction, summarize the following table, um, examples of, of um, input output pairs, and then you have the input that you're trying to make a prediction on right now. And that's just concatenated into a string. And the language model just conditions on that sequence. And then you ask it to just generate from the, you're just generating from the language model. So this is kind of a wacky, really wacky idea, um, but it actually works you know, surprisingly well. Um, there is a con, however, that you can only train on a few examples. So you can do few shot learning, and so to the extent that your task only demands a few number of examples, you're great, you're done. But realistically, most kind of serious tasks actually do require a lot of examples. And you're not going to be able to stuff all these examples into the context window of the, uh, the model. And also, this only works with GPT-3. It doesn't really work with GPT-2. So you are kind of already kind of need to work with these large models, which um, uh, you probably, if you're lucky to get access to. But we can take the general idea here, which is prompting, and see if we can kind of make this uh, work a little bit better. Um, so the idea with prompting is, suppose you want to solve a task that maps input to output. And so the idea is you're going to design some sort of prefix that you're going to stick in front and construct this prompt so that when you generate from language model, you get the right thing. So if your task is to predict uh, capitals of countries, you might construct a prefix that is, says the capital of, and then you fit in the input, and then you let the language model just uh, produce the output, and you know that's how you solve this task. Um, but what about more complicated tasks like this, uh, you know, structured table to uh, text generation? Um, you have to do a little bit of like kind of wacky um, serialization of the structured input into a string, which already doesn't look like natural language. So it's kind of weird. Um, and maybe you can, what should you use for the prefix? Maybe describe, maybe summarize this table. Um, it's a little bit kind of uh, um, kind of hacky, whatever you put here. 
and the but and you want this um, language model then to output um, the output uh, text. So this gets a little bit. Uh, what where is the capital of France is Paris? Seems kind of more. It seems easier to design the prefix. Some you can't really do this for arbitrary tasks easily. Um, so how powerful is this idea anyway? So the prefix seems to be a good idea, and it's it, GPT three does show that it can be can do things, but is it, uh, are there limitations? And suppose it were good, how can we find a prefix? So the analogy is that you have this model uh, that can do all these you know, weird things. And what you're doing is you're trying to put a little carrot in front of it or a watermelon, or you're trying to figure out this prefix that if the, the model ingests this, you'll get it to do um, uh, uh, you know, amazing things, which is you can, you know, I'm being kind of a little bit ridiculous on purpose because it, it is a little bit of a kind of throwing darts um, in the dark. So there is some work that tries to do this automatically. You can search for um, this auto prompt, search for this discrete prefix. They ran it on um, sentiment classification and show that you can get some results. Um, for generation, I think it's maybe a little bit more, you know, tricky. Um, and of course, the discrete search is kind of always a, a kind of annoying. So what we're going to do is prefix tuning. And before I introduce prefix tuning, I want to introduce a little bit more notation. So here's um, the standard setup in fine tuning. So you have your input. It's a sequence of tokens. You have your output Y. It's a sequence of tokens. I'm going to call the concatenation Z. And um, a language model, um, autoregressive language model, computes a hidden of, or a vector uh, for each position. And this vector is of dimensionality, the number of layers times the dimensionality of each layer. And this is going to be computed for, based on some function of all the previous hidden uh, vectors, as well as the current input slash you know, output. So RNNs fit into this, transformers fit into this. Um, I'm not, it doesn't really matter as much to the details. Uh, and then when you've, you, so you define this transformer, and then what you're going to do is just fine tune all these parameters. So this is kind of my pictorial description of a, what a transformer is. You're, you're computing these H's at each uh, a time step and it has all these parameters in pink and you're just gonna fine tune all of them to maximize the probability of Y given X over your training set. Okay, so prefix tuning is just a slight modification to, but important modification to this. So I'm going to think about um, prepending these virtual tokens, which I'm going to denote as star. They're not tokens, um, so, but there's just there's placeholders here. That's going to be the prefix, and I'm going to compute again the sequence of hidden uh, vectors. And but what I'm going to do is, if I'm in H I H one and H two are just going to be completely free parameters, which I'm going to call theta. I'm going to be able to tune them to set them to be whatever I want. And then the rest of this recurrence is the same as before. And now what I'm going to do is tune only this prefix. I'm going to leave the rest of the language modeling parameters you know, alone, which means I can, I only need to tune a very, very small subset of the parameters. And this, I can still influence generation because of the way that you know, self-attention works. Um, all of these predictions are going to depend on the prefix in some, some way. Okay, maybe I'll stop there in case there's questions about what prefix tuning is. Um, I think we have any in the chat on prefix tuning yet. Okay. Okay, let me move on then. Um, so, so how do, well does this do? So we ran this on this restaurant reviews data set called E to E. So the task is given a structured uh, you know, table, uh, output of the sentence. And here I'm plotting uh, the percentage of tunable parameters by the blue score. So fine tuning is here. I'm tuning all the parameters and I get some level of blue score here. If I tune the only the top two layers, then the accuracy drops a little. For this data set, it's not too bad. You drop a little bit, and now you're down to 22% of the parameters. 
Um, adaptive tuning, which is this kind of nice idea, um, actually surprisingly does even better than fine tuning, tuning only 3% of the parameters. Um, but when you really press adaptive tuning and say like train only 0.1% of the parameters, it actually doesn't do as well. Whereas prefix tuning is actually kind of, kind of shockingly good because it's pre training only 0.1% of the parameters and it's actually better than both adaptive tuning and full fine tuning. So in this, at least on this data set, there's really no reason to do fine tuning because you actually get a smaller model and you're doing better with prefix tuning. Um, second data set, uh, same idea, structured uh, table, um, and you're generating a, a text. Um, so fine tuning, uh, if you uh, tune the top two layers, then accuracy drops quite a bit for this data set. Adaptive tuning uh, recuperates some, but not all of the, the gains. And then point 0.1 um, is, is a lot worse. And prefix tuning now is slightly worse than the fine tuning, but it's still pretty good and certainly better than adaptive tuning. Um, and the third data set, uh, similar trends, um, fine tuning, the top two layers is just uh, not, very, not very good. Adaptive tuning works a little bit better, but not at these low regimes of uh, number of parameters you're tuning. And uh, uh, prefix tuning uh, reached, obtains comparable accuracy to fine, full fine tuning, but only touching 0.1% of the parameters. So on summarization, you have to adapt the, the idea to um, kind of an encoder decoder approach, which I'm gonna uh, skip over the details. Here, prefix tuning is a bit worse than fine tuning. Summarization, I think is a much more complicated task. The sequences are longer. So prefix tuning, I think we're seeing a little bit of kind of it running into a, a wall here, even with uh, pre prefix tuning 2% of the parameters, it's um, still not uh, as good as uh, fine tuning, um, but you know, it's not bad. You're, you're still getting pretty good accuracy here. So besides just normal accuracy, one I think really, really interesting thing that we found is uh, extrapolation. So, um, so the setting is that you're gonna train on examples which are from certain types of categories. So for example, sentences about buildings, um, re relating to buildings, and you're gonna test on five completely unseen categories like you know, for artists. And so there's some overlap between this uh, set of fields, for example, birthplace shows up in both places, but there are unique um, attributes that you have to just somehow generalize to in a zero shot way. And for this task, we look at the define tuning methods versus adapter and prefix tuning. And we see a kind of dramatic separation here. Um, the fine tuning approaches actually don't work very well on in this extrapolation setting at all. Whereas adapter tuning and prefix tuning now are kind of uh, at the same level in terms of being able to generalize a lot you know, better out of domain. So our hypothesis here is that preserving the language model is important for extrapolation. So fine tuning, while you might get good accuracy on a kind of your training distribution, um, it intuitively kind of destroys the parameters and makes it less like a language model. Whereas um, over here, if both adapter tuning and to a greater extent prefix tuning holds most of the language param modeling parameters fixed, which could explain um, a bit why it extrapolates better. So one other ablation here is that um, suppose that you uh, tune only the embedding layer um, rather than the full um, kind of depth of the transformer. Uh, so if you do that, then you see that the accuracy is uh, now nowhere near as good. Um, and note that the, I mean, the thing that I actually important to note is that you know, optimization over this, this a discrete pre prefix, which is what Autoprompt does and what we would do by like, Know, trying to hack the GPT-3 prompt to do what you want is even less expressive than, um, than uh, training the embedding. So what this shows is that at least right now, we think that it's really important to be able to tune the full depth of these um, networks at, on the prefix. Um, gives you more expressive power to be able to solve these more you know, complicated um, you know, tasks. It's also worth noting that these virtual tokens are not tokens at all because these, um, these vectors don't represent 
any words. Um, in fact, they don't even represent any word embeddings. They're just like pre-parameters that somehow if you stick in front of this model, then the model, the LM is like happy to like read into the prefix and do the task that you want. It's a little bit kind of um, weird, but it's optimized to, so that by construction, the task is uh, gets, you get good accuracy on the task. Okay, to summarize the section, um, we show this uh, idea called prefix tuning. I think it's a kind of a happy marriage of two ideas. You can do fine tuning and with language models, you can do conditioning. So it's kind of taking the idea of conditioning and saying, can we use that to construct a mechanism to do kind of fine tune, selective fine tuning? Um, the empirical results are pretty strong um, that you get by tuning 0.1% of the parameters, you get comparable performance and even better, it extrapolates better out of domain. There's a bunch of open questions here, I think, which are exciting to answer. Um, we're still lagging a bit behind on the more complicated tasks like summarization. Can we close that? We don't really understand why prefix tuning works completely. We currently hypothesize it's because it preserves the LM parameters, um, but I think a further investigation is needed. And more importantly, I think this is maybe a, just a one example of possible other lar much larger space of lightweight fine tuning strategies that would be interesting to explore. All right, I'll pause a bit for questions. Okay, um, feel free to toss a question in the chat, but I'll maybe start with one. So this is related to your last point, which means um, it might it might be future work. But uh, is there something is there something essential about natural language processing in, in the success of these methods, or are there lessons for computer vision? I mean, you could imagine doing something like controlling the neural net behavior via some sort of maybe useless part of the input dimensions or something like that. So treating part of the image as a prefix. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I certainly haven't thought about um, um, computer vision and how that would look like, what that would look like. Um, I think some, I think at least part, I, I'm sure there's like various maybe clever lightweight fine tuning things you can do in computer vision as well. I think one thing that we're leaning on is this idea of prompting and latch, the sequential nature of natural language where you kind of have like question and then answer or there's kind of a sequential nature here. Um, maybe you could do something with you know, video. Um, I'm, that's a kind of a, something that comes to mind for you know, images. Maybe you have kind of a shadow image and then you prompt it to do, get it to do um, other things. Um, just That's just kind of maybe speculation if you had a good video model, um, which might be harder <laughs> than solving the you know, actual task. But, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I have to think more about that. Anything else in the chat? Okay. Uh, do you guys typically stop at one or? Uh, we can go a bit over. Okay. All right. So um, I will go through this. So this last part is a, a little bit weird. Um, it, it raises a big question and we don't answer it. So this is more an invitation uh, to the community to discuss these issues as opposed to presenting here is the final answer. So um, the question here is, can small and synthetic benchmarks drive modeling innovation? Let's work with Nelson, Tony, and uh, Robin. So it's been clear that um, in NLP, but also um, more broadly in uh, machine learning, data sets have really given rise to a bunch of different modeling innovations, like seek to seek attention, transformers. I think all of these you can trace back to some data set that motivated uh, the need to develop these innovations, which is really kind of cool. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of new data sets coming out. Um, and now the, the question is, you know, what should we pay attention? What is the advice to give to someone designing a data set? Right now, there's not really much guidance. You kind of follow your nose and say, oh, okay, well, let's see. We want the data set to be somewhat challenging and capture some sort of phenomenon we care about, but it's all very kind of mushy, right? So I'm gonna to try to take a stab at seeing, making this a little bit more crisp. 
So there's two pieces of conventional wisdom about what makes a good data set, which I'm going to um, challenge here or question at least. So one is that the more realistic data set, the better. And this is articulated by many people, but uh, in particular one paper, which talks about ecological validity, which means that the data set should be represented of real users in real settings. Otherwise you're just solving the wrong problem. So convention of wisdom number two is that bigger data sets are better. And you know, even back when we created the SWOT data set, that was certainly big top of mind. It's like, we want large data sets though that um, you can make meaningful progress because if it's small, then you can't really you know, do much. So are these actually correct? And before answering this question, I wanna make a really important distinction um, between direct and indirect improvement. So direct improvement means anything you do to improve an actual system, let's say for a question answering. So here, I think it's clear that more realistic and largest data sets are better. You want data that comes from your actual you know, uh, test distribution. Um, um, and you want the more data we know asymptotically like error goes down as more data. So that's pretty uncontroversial, I think. What's less clear, I think is indirect improvement. These are improvements that try to improve a modeling approach. And I would argue that a lot of, if not all of research is really fundamentally about indirect improvement. We're trying to generate better ideas so that these ideas then can be taken into different contexts to yield direct improvement. So here it's less clear that this actual bigger and uh, more realistic is actually the right thing to do. So here is a, is a kind of a, a anecdotal example, which I, I think shed some light on the matter. So LSTMs, at least before transformers, they were kind of really big in um, NLP. Um, and the original LSTM paper from 1997, this is, you know, Jürgen schmidt and Sepp Holtkreider's paper, um, evaluated on these toy tasks. And so there's, and uh, so obviously no direct improvement. They didn't really solve anything real, so to speak, but they created this idea LSTMs of how to uh, capture long-term memory, which was incredibly useful and influential, and you know later got actually deployed into real systems. So this is like kind of like a kind of a really example where you know synthetic data sets are actually um, at some time scale you know really uh, useful. So let's turn to NLP and look at maybe less uh, a smaller time scale and see if we can kind of get. Um, something more quantitative and measure these trends. So the squad data set is a question answering data set. You're given a passage, you're given a question, and the goal is to predict the answer from the passage. And over the last um, four or five years, there's just been a lot of different modeling approaches developed for uh, this data set. And um, here are you know, some of them. Um, and you know, the, now retrospectively after five years, we can ask the question, do we actually need squad to drive all this modeling innovation or could we have gone, gone away with something simpler? Um, this is um, an answer to not that question, but I want to put it out there just to highlight the contrast again between direct and indirect improvement. So there's been work by, out of Berkeley, um, John Miller and Ludwig Schmidt and others um, show that took a look at all the squad systems. So remember system is model with actual parameters. This is something that was submitted to the squad leaderboard. Um, and you plot the squad in domain accuracy versus a out of domain accuracy. And what you find is that there's actually pretty good correlation between in domain and out of domain, which means that direct improvements on squad in domain accuracy generally do translate to good out of domain accuracy. So this is, I think, really nice um, because now you can work in domain and um, because out of domain data might be um, you know, hard to collect or impossible to collect and you can make meaningful gains in, um, in, in the system performance. But like I said, this is not the question we're you know, answering. And there's certainly other data sets, which like if you train on the synthetic data set, I don't think you would uh, get correlation at all. So the experiment we actually did was uh, measuring indirect improvement. So here, every point here is a modeling approach, which is going to be a neural architecture plus a training procedure, including you know, various 
all the you know hyperparameters and so on. Um, and what we're going to um, do is we're going to look at all the different modeling approaches that were developed that evaluated on squad and we're going to um, train on squad evaluate on squad and that's going to be the the x-axis and then i'm going to train on news qa which is a different qa data set and test on news qa and that's going to be the y-axis so there's everything is in domain um, there's no od generalization and then we look at the correlation. So here, it looks actually like there is pretty good you know, correlation between um, improvements in the modeling approach, like when you go from these um, to, so these are like pre-training approaches and these are not pre before pre-training. And you see that pre-training just you know, helps you on squad, you measure that and it also helps you on use QA and better pre-training approaches help on, on both. Um, Roughly, it's it's not as maybe uh, linear as this curve, but it's you know it's definitely some signal. So what we define as a notion of concurrence between two data sets is you measure the you train on the train split of D1, test on D2, and you get this accuracy. And you do the same thing with D2, and now you measure the correlation between of this basically of these points, and that's a concurrence. Um, so in the rest of the talk, this section, I'm going to look at, um, the concurrence of various different data sets against squad. Um, and then I'll come back to, you know, what that really means. So first you can look at all these, uh, question answering data sets, um, that were constructed after squad, each one trying to address something different about than that squad didn't capture. For example, questions that were created without looking at, without crowd workers looking at the answer, which is introduces bias, or real questions from real users, things that require numerical reasoning and so on. And we see that all the data sets, except for this drop data set, um, is you actually have high concurrence with squad. Um, I think this suggests, and I'll only say suggests because we don't have any definitive proof that maybe the, all the details of how the data set were constructed and all the biases are actually less important for kind of driving these overall trends of modeling innovation. So then we decided to say, okay, well, these are human constructed data set. What if we took at, look at more, we're trying to go more synthetic, see how, how little can we get away with? So, there's a lot of uh, these uh, closed data sets, which are automatically constructed from raw text, which is, makes it really nice to create these data sets. Um, so this is a children's book test by Felix Hill and others back in 2016. So you take a text and then you just ask, take the last sentence, you turn it into a question, you blank out some word and you ask the language model to basically fill in that word, um, the model to fill in that word. Um, so there's a bunch of these closed style data sets and we see that um, CBT, Children's Book Test, and Lambda actually have really good concurrence, um, less so on some of these other data sets. Um, you know, but you wouldn't expect, you wouldn't necessarily, when we went into this, we didn't necessarily expect concurrence at all on anything because these data sets are just like, you know, statistically kind of different. But so it was kind of interesting to see that even on, CB, on the CBT and Lambda data sets, there was, you know, good concurrence. And then we said, okay, what if we went really synthetic? So there's this in the a kind of a paragon of synthetic data sets is this baby data set by Jason Weston and others, um, which were more aimed at kind of uh, these reasoning tasks. And we see that the concurrence is uh, pretty bad uh, with respect to squad. I should stress that low concurrence isn't necessarily, doesn't mean that this data set is bad. It just means that this data set probably wouldn't have produced the same modeling innovations as squad. In particular, baby focuses on these kind of uh, reasoning abilities and less on the kind of capturing the long tail of nat real natural language. So can now the question is, okay, baby was going a little bit too far. Maybe can we step back and say, you know, can we generate a data set that doesn't real use real text, but still concurs? Um, and we, our first attempt was to generate uh, this thing called fuzzy synthetic QA, 
which you just generate some random words. Um, and then you um, ask a question, you've, which is um, you, you just take a subsequence of these words and you um, kind of perturb them by uh, in this uh, glove embedding space. So you take a word, you look at the glove embedding, you find the nearest neighbor and you replace it. So um, it's, it's kind of mimicking uh, synonymy. Um, and you see that on this data set, so overall concurrence is very low. So this doesn't have good concurrence, but if you look at the non-pre-trained models, so these models over here, the concurrence is actually pr no, pretty good, I think, um, which suggests that, well, if before putting aside pre-training, if back in 2016 to 2018, maybe the, all the modeling innovation was basically about um, just doing better fuzzy pattern matching, which I think a lot of papers have kind of suspected. And this is kind of, um, maybe this gives additional um, insight into like what these model in the innovations are actually you know, trying to do. So now what about these pre-trained um, models? So it's probably because pre-training benefits from looking at um, uh, real language and also squad is real language, maybe we need to incorporate something a little bit more real. So we showed that we can do something with just Wikidata, which is a structured knowledge uh, base of data beta facts. It's not real language. And so it's just a bunch of triples, entity relation entity, um, like uh, J. May Jemison profession astronaut. And we just like plotted, a, a, chose a bunch of triples and put the concatenate them together. So again, pretty artificial. Um, and we took one of them as the, uh, the answer. And then we created a question from the, uh, by basically applying a similar fuzzing operation by the alias and hyponyms and inverse relations uh, given by weak data. The details aren't so important, but there is a bunch of not so uh, complicated stuff that um, one did to create something that looks uh, really not like a real question answering data set. But yeah, we saw that it had high concurrence. So this is kind of at least an existence proof that data sets that don't look like anything like a QA data set can actually concur with the modeling improvements on with respect to squat. Um, we also looked at um, how much the size matter. And this is showing concurrence between subsampled squad and squad. So squad was the training set was around 80,000 uh, examples. And we subsampled all the way down to 20,000 or maybe even 10,000. And we saw that there was high concurrence. So this certainly suggests that I could have saved a lot of money by just like gathering a 20K data set and just putting them from the community and having them kind of uh, hill climb on it. Um, of course, uh, well, you know, it's a counterfactual. So we never know what would, what would have happened. So now I want to take a step back and be very kind of um, sober about what we're saying and what we're not saying. So there's this underlying causal question of interest. Would a particular data set produce modeling innovation if we were to release it? That's what we want to know when we're designing new data sets. But obviously we can't answer this question. So we're kind of asking a counterfactual question with respect to squad would a particular data set have produced the same modeling innovations as squad? So this is closer, but we're still not answering this because we can't go back in time and release the data set into the wild and see what would happen. Um, what the th question we're actually answering is, does a particular data set concur with squad on squad models? So this is a very specific, and I think it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. So there's a, bunch of caveats with this kind of concurrence, which I just want to point out. Um, first is that there, what we're talking about is you know, intrinsic factors of a data set. There's obviously extrinsic factors. Data sets influence how researchers think of modeling approaches. You know, people get excited that this the data set looks real, so they work on it, and all sorts of crazy factors, which we're not taking into account. Modeling innovations are driven by multiple data sets. And for example, transformers were developed um, for, you know, for translation. And there's a lot of cross-pollination now, especially with uh, the rise of pre-training. 
So it's impossible to kind of associate, at least retrospectively, the uh, attribute a particular data set in its contribution to modeling advances. It has to be, the reality is more complex. And finally, we're evaluating on squad models. And concurrence doesn't mean that if we actually went and released a particular data set that the, the gains on that data set would translate to squad because it's just a different set of models which would be have counterfactually then produced. But you know, to summarize so far, um, I hope this was kind of an interesting, um, perhaps controversial, but somewhat interesting uh, uh, you know, discussion on you know, the question of whether a data set, what makes a data set good. Um, concurrence, I think, is a helpful tool to nail down at least a, a small fraction of that uh, question. And it captures to what the extent to which two data sets could have driven the modeling innovations. innovations. Definitely not saying that it would. Um, I think it was interesting um, to, that we were able to construct a small instance synthetic data set that concurs with squad. Um, this was not obvious that it was possible you know, at all when we started the project. And maybe the one kind of high level takeaway is that you really shouldn't judge a data set by its looks in both directions. Just because the data set doesn't look good doesn't mean it's not useful. And just because the data set looks like it, it checks some boxes in terms of, oh, this seems like a great data set doesn't mean that doesn't, isn't full of artifacts that makes it kind of in really meaningless to kind of develop on. Again, there's lots of caveats and the goal is hopefully to spur some discussion about what makes a good data set um, with the hope that eventually we'll be able to come to a, a, a better, more principled way of designing data sets. Okay, so let me just kind of uh, conclude, wrap up in this one slide. So um, we're entering a very kind of interesting and exciting time where we have just huge models with a lot of power. Um, and I think it makes sense to think about how do we actually harness them for downstream tasks. This is especially kind of top of mind when you think about large language models uh, for you know, generation uh, because they're, they're truthy but not truthful. Um, and you know, in th issues of interpretability and controllability, I think are really you know, important um, to address if these models are to be kind of used in um, kind of high stakes settings. Um, finally, there's also issues of efficiency, which I talked about in prefix tuning. These, as these large language models become large, we need to be able to uh, use maybe tune only a subset of parameters or be able to do inference more efficiently. I think those, those are really interesting questions as well. All right, so uh, thank you all for your attention and thanks to my collaborators again. Great, thanks. So I guess we have some time for questions. Um, I'm not gonna ask any, I've taken too much of the floor. So uh, maybe I'll start with one that was asked by Ren Liao in the concept bottleneck section. So the question is, do you think modeling the structure or relation of concepts would help for that? So um, uh, for example, a word net type of data. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. The, as we designed the, the concept bottleneck network, um, um, we're kind of predicting these concepts more or less deterministically. So there's kind of no random structure on the concepts themselves. You could imagine producing a distribution over the concepts in which case it would make sense to think about kind of uh, uh, correlations between the different concepts. And I think certainly in uh, practical applications, I think modeling that distribution does uh, make a lot of sense. And you can always think about it, then you're kind of thinking about it as a graphical model where uh, people can like query uh, concepts um, in the graphical model style. Great. And then maybe we'll just move to the chat. So Mohammed. Uh, Yagini asks, have you considered, I guess this is about the last section, have you considered how much of a high concurrence data set is explainable by the language model itself and how much of it is explained by the effectiveness of the data set? Uh, how much, let's see, explained by the language model itself. Um, so, so if you look at some of these uh, results, um, Let's see, let's look at this plot. Um, over here are models that use language models. I assume you mean kind of these large pre-trained language models. Uh, oh, actually, I, I'm actually sure if you, do you mean pre-trained? 
language model? Yes, uh, let, let me elaborate for that. By that, uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. And uh, so my question is: uh, is these high concurrence uh, data sets uh, like uh, what? Uh, how much of that, uh, the fact that they're high concurrent is explainable by the fact that, of, that the language itself is, is cogent and like any text, regardless of what particular uh, domain it is in, it has uh, the specificities of, of the language, the human language model, right? So it is, uh, uh, so maybe a lot of these concurrences that we see is because uh, these are basically, uh, Data that comes from human language, and like, and how much of it is really explainable by the fact that uh, well, these data are uh, these data sets are doing a very good job of representing that. Yeah, let me, let me try to maybe clarify a few things, and let me know if this is answering your question. The um, one of the reasons we wanted to look at synthetic data sets uh, um, was to really understand like what the what were the essential properties that the models were actually modeling? And so this data set, um, there are words, but there's no structure. There's zero structure in the, the passage. So I think uh, it's, you could say that it's fairly not natural language like. It doesn't have a Ziffian distribution. There's no kind of a normal correlation. And it still shows concurrence. So if you just look at this slide, it shows concurrence with squad you know, data sets. So this suggests that um, at least some of these modeling innovations are not really about language or natural language, at least per se, but more kind of general sequence modeling, you know, innovations, capturing um, issues of memory or long range, you know, dependence um, or dealing with noise and, and so on. Um, some of these other, uh, models or when you look at pre-training, I think those there's some sort of like convergence where all the models after a certain after 2018 are very similar in some sense. They're all trained on huge corpora with transformer like architectures. So um, it's it's hard to maybe disentangle the nature of language from the fact that the architect, I mean, another thing is that the architectures, we're not testing all architectures. There's only architectures that are essentially based on, you know, a transformer. So it's possible that, you know, concurrence would be much lower if you were looking uh, more broadly at all the possible um, ways of solving a problem. Can I ask a question? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, I wonder uh, for the concept bottleneck model, um, what's your thought on how to learn concept without any concept labels? And what do you think would be need for the data set or the model to change in order to learn that? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. The, um, so one immediate thing you can imagine is to uh, try to get away with a much fewer concept labels. Um, so think about act, you can think about active learning approaches that try to query only the labels, concept labels, which you're uncertain about. Um, I think it's an interesting active learning question because um, there's, uh, you're not looking at uh, just labels on individual data points, but you're looking at um, information like at a more granular level for each example. Um, and I expect the gains that you get from kind of more adaptive querying to be higher in the setting than normal uh, active learning. Um, beyond that, I think um, if I think it's hard to do something without any uh, labels at all. This gets back to an earlier question about like, can you just learn them um, from like a more in an unsupervised way? And if you're not careful, then you just like end back to where we started, which is like just train the end to end model. Um, but if maybe if you're judicious in incorporating, you know, prior knowledge in, then you could get meaningful results. For example, if you, even if you try to maybe encourage, like one natural thing is encouraging disentangling of uh, concepts, maybe 
Um, of course, that's no guarantee that it matches the human concepts that you want. And in particular, the human concepts are not disentangled. They're, uh, they're interpretable, but they're not um, necessarily like statistically independent or by any means. Um, or you can imagine like uh, models with a bit more uh, structure in them. Like you know, imagine you have like a, you know, know some sort of um, physics uh, simulator or uh, you know, a graphic simulator that actually captures something about um, your distribution. So that's not providing labels, but that's providing um, some information. So I think you have to do add something to the system. I don't think you can get interoperability and control without uh, with just kind of doing things end to end. Okay, thank you. Um, May I ask one more question? Yep, go for it. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, thanks for your great talk. So I have one question regarding to your uh, prefix tuning network. So if I, uh, correct me if I understand uh, wrong. So um, so the transformer can be thought of as a, a fully collected graph collecting every token and then you self, use self-attention to kind of gather messages from other tokens. So then in that sense, uh, uh, does it matter is a prefix by adding some you know extra latent or extra token in in front because to me it's more like a, you're adding a dummy node where you uh, collect to every other nodes in the graph but uh, of course the positional embedding you add to the transformer matters here but I'm just wondering have you tweaked the uh, the positional part uh, whether prefix is really you know important or you can actually Insert this in, you know, in between tokens or maybe a su suffix or something like that. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, the answer is that it's you're you're right that there's kind of order independence and it, I, the prefix is more expository at, at some level because like these tokens could be anywhere here because of self attention for the encoder decoder um, models because if you think about encoding the prefix in X then it, it, the order doesn't matter. Um, now for generating Y, uh, of course, because of autoregressive nature, there's, there is an ordering there. So if you, um, in our paper, we have experiments on infixing, uh, which is you, instead of doing a prefix, you insert it here, which means that you're, um, you basically do self-intention over X and then you uh, look at um, the prefix and then Y can condition on everything. And that's worse than prefix tuning. So I think it is at least important for the representations of X, um, all of these vectors to be dependent on the prefix. I think that's the kind of the core issue where it shows up, it, I think is, it's just easier to explain if I put it in as a prefix. I see, I see, thanks. Yeah, I'm thinking of this because like you, I'm trying to map it to computer vision where you, it's hard to see like you conditioning on the top left corner of the image to generate, you know, the rest because that, uh, that absolute uh, pose or position doesn't incorporate much information. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, can I ask one more question? Um, okay, but it should be quick because uh, we need sure. to- Good yeah, should be very, very quick one. Uh, just the, the in terms of the, the maybe this question from a little bit different area. I'm working for the financial sector. So in terms of data, and how you consider your research result to the time series? Uh, are you asking about uh, the prefix tuning and how? Uh, it yes, the and the, the both of them. I found a both of the as partly the bottleneck, uh, bottleneck, uh, bottleneck, bottleneck the the model, and for that model. I can see a lot of similarity between the existing approach in the financial sector. For example, in the financial sector, in order to nail down the major driving force or factors, and we use something similar. So I'd like to get, the, get your take on the, have you, have you got considered some kind of application for, the, for downstream like finance? Yeah, the short answer is no, we haven't looked at time series. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you could imagine uh, having concepts that are have some temporal extent or change over over time as well. Mm -hmm. um, that would be, you know, I, I think some of these ideas could extend uh, naturally. 
Um, and in the prefix tuning case, I guess, um, I, I guess there is a temporal sequence here. Um, and I'm not sure that's saying very much, but at least uh, one could, I think it types checks to uh, imagine applying these to time series, but you know, the short answer is we haven't really explored that very 